Wise, pediatric speech language pathologist, and welcome to my podcast number 455, Expressive Language Milestones by 24 Months, brought to you by my website, Teach Me to Talk, where we're the largest ASHA provider of continuing education courses for early intervention. Thank you so much for being here. If it's your first course, welcome. We want to be your main provider for continuing education opportunities with a library of over 77 courses to choose from. If it's not your first course, welcome back. It's always a privilege to have you join me for everything related to uh, talking about early language development, so I'm so excited that you're here. Now, today we're continuing our Language Milestones podcast series. This is actually show number six of a 14-part series where we're looking at all the developmental language milestones from about 12 months all the way through 48 months. Now, we've tackled these milestones in six-month increments one show for receptive language and then one show for expressive language. So in this course, we're all the way up to the 24 month level. And again, we're looking at expressive language milestones. For therapists, I'm including the link below to purchase CE credit for this course. That includes the CE credit with a certificate and also the show notes or a handout that's perfect for sharing with families. Uh, Again, you can use the handout to introduce strategies during sessions and also as a tool to give parents to take home so that they can remember what they're supposed to be working on. Now for parents, this handout is a fantastic reference for you as well. And we're going to be talking about the milestones today and then all the specific instructions and step-by-step directions for you to work on these milestones at home. So I highly recommend this handout. Now so many parents and grandparents have asked how they can support our work. So you can purchase the handout for $5 or any other amount that you would like to give. So you can find those links below, uh, whether you're a therapist or a a parent to be able to get those handouts. Now for parents tuning in to see how your child is doing, let's go ahead and take a look at the milestones and review this list and talk about just a really short definition for what all of these milestones mean. And again, you can take a look at the milestones listed right here on your handout. So the first one is uses new words regularly. So what does that mean? I took a look at the stats and they are all over the place. Uh, The most credible reference was that from eight months to six years, kids learn on average eight words a day. Now, if that scares you as a parent of a late talker, I understand that. And actually, the stats, like I said, were all over the place. The bottom line was we need to hear new words every single day, and especially by the time that a a child reaches this 24-month developmental level. Uh, Going with that is the second milestone, which is uses single words frequently. So what does that mean? It means that you hear words all the time. There is no question that a child is talking by the time they reach this developmental level. The third skill is imitates phrases. Now we talked about this back in the previous show about expressive language development, which would have been course number 453. But by 18 months in typical language development, toddlers are usually imitating short at least two word phrases, sometimes three word phrases routinely. So by 24 months, we want the ability to imitate phrases to be firmly established. And then beyond that, the next milestone is that they would use short phrases spontaneously or on their own. And again, this would be two or three word phrases that they come up with by combining words, not that they hear you say, not an imitation, but this time it's completely original. So they take different words from their little vocabulary and put them together and generate their own little phrases. The next milestone is relates personal experiences. Now this is where a child uses words rather than gestures, rather than crying. (laughs) They're actually able to now communicate with you using words. And we'll talk more about what exactly that looks like at this developmental level when we review all the skills. The next one is that they refer to themselves by name. And again, this is usually in phrases. So if a child's name is Emmy, She might say, Emmy's baby, or give to Emmy. So instead of hearing the pronoun, which is actually the next milestone, uses early pronouns occasionally, we hear a child use their names in place of that. So that was a list of all the milestones that we're going to be talking about throughout this course. Now the first four milestones on this list are just huge in terms of language development. We're going to spend most of our time talking about these four milestones in this course and we'll briefly discuss the last three because they also carry over to the next 
age range. So the big focuses here in this developmental level are vocabulary development and then increasing complexity or as a uh, speech language pathologist would say or think about increasing a child's MLU or mean length of utterances. So here that means that kids bump up not from being predominantly a single word user to but a multiple word user when they're talking. And what we're really saying here is that kids again use words consistently all the time without a doubt they are now talking and uh, that complexity begins to increase as they shift those utterances again from those single words to phrases. So by 24 months we want to hear lots of those two word phrase combinations and then even begin to hear that next little level bump up with three word phrases here occasionally. Now let's talk about mean length of utterance. Now if you are a speech language pathologist you know what that means and back in grad school we did we spent lots of time in our first language development courses talking about how to calculate MLU. We are not going to do that here, but it is an important uh, point to talk about with parents so that they understand that there's the, the jump up here happens in this 18 to 24 month developmental level. They're no longer at that 1.0 MLU, but they actually bump up to 1.25 to 1.5. Uh, so you can see again that phrases are present, which makes sure that that MLU is bumped on up. So due to this phenomenal rate of growth with expressive language during this 18 to 24 month developmental period, Experts call this the language explosion phase, and it's so, so exciting for parents when their child gets to this point. Now remember, for those of you who are parents of late talkers, all of the things that we're talking about today will happen with a child who is later to develop and acquire language milestones, but they just happen a little bit later. So even though you may be listening to the show and thinking, my child is well over his second birthday, that's okay, because this is a wonderful goal list for new talkers, because the major focuses here, remember, are what? Vocabulary development and then increasing that mean length of utterance. So we're just going to pay attention to the sequence. We have to know what comes next and then what comes next beyond that, which will make our efforts very, very logical when we're working with a child so that a child doesn't plateau and we're working on things in the correct order. We're going to find that sweet spot developmentally so we know that a child isn't going to jump from not talking at all to phrases. There are lots of things that have come in between that first developmental level and now. So again, it makes things so much easier for everybody, for a child's therapist, for a child's parent, and certainly for the child when we're working at that just right developmental level. I really encourage parents that I'm working with directly on my caseload to not get hung up on age ranges. Just know where we're going with this. So again, if you're a parent with an older child tuning in, if they are at single words, this is is the perfect course for you to listen to or podcast for you to listen to because again your child needs to bump up to that next developmental level which is combining words to use phrases so there will be great recommendations for you as well all right in every show in this podcast series we've begun with a quick review of expressive language and receptive language so that we're sure that we're all on the same page and if you're a therapist I would certainly encourage you to do the same thing with the parents that you're working with so that they really understand the difference now today we're talking about expressive language, which means what a child says. This is different from receptive language, which means what a child understands or the language he receives, and it can also be referred to as auditory comprehension. Now there's a very definitive relationship between expressive language and receptive language. When a child has a receptive language delay, when he does not understand words at a level commiserate with his same age peers, he's going to have an expressive language language delay too. And why is that? Because kids can't talk about or use words that they don't understand what they mean. So when babies have difficulty with comprehension, during that second year of life, we know that they're going to have difficulty with talking too. We also have kids though who have no receptive language delays who are still late talkers. These are kids who follow directions, kids who understand conversations, but for one reason or another, they're still not talking. By this developmental age range, all kids should be talking and talking a lot. So in this show, we're going to spend lots of time talking about what to do if a child is not there yet. And again, primarily our little friends who are late talkers who are just missing that expressive language piece. 
In this show, we're going to talk about the 11 best strategies to really get that language going and again, increase that complexity so that a child goes from a few words to lots and lots of words and then he's able to combine phrases. So let's go ahead and start with our first milestone, which is uses new words regularly. When we're talking about using new words regularly, what we're really referring to is vocabulary development. So let's start by looking at what the research tells us is typical for expressive language development during this developmental phase because there's lots and lots of disparity out there. Now, because the range of normal is pretty broad, uh, some parents and some professionals kind of take license with that and say, well, wherever a kid is, is just where he is. However, we know that development, that the pattern is not as broad as you would think. For example, last year, the CDC referral for pediatricians that they released in, er, that information they released in early 2022 was terrible guidance for parents and horribly inconsistent with evidence-based practice. The most egregious example was actually right here close to this developmental level when they said, that a child needed to be referred for uh, a language evaluation or a speech language evaluation by 30 months if he or she did not have at least three words. Now this is a gross <laughs> misrepresentation of what we all know is normal about language development and it really does offer a false sense of security for parents of late talkers and I think instead of that original intention to increase referrals it will actually delay referrals and keep families from accessing services that they need long before a child turns 30 months. So let's take a look at the evidence-based data about normal vocabulary size throughout childhood. Now, my source on this is Linguistics Guide to Communication Skills, and again, if you want to take a look at that, it's all listed on the handout. Now, the decline in standardized scores right now is pretty scary, so let me just say that, uh, again, these are our current milestones. What pre-pandemic, what was normal, or what we're hearing now from the early studies that have been released, what was normal for a 12-month-old now may be bumped up to an older age range, particularly for social skills and communication skills due to the effects of the lockdowns. Again, that's a topic for another day, but I did want to kind of go ahead and give this a little bit of a disclaimer. So if you're watching this and th later and things have changed. Here, I also want to add another slant for therapists. As professionals, we work with kids who are delayed, and so we begin to use these tests and these assessments year after year after year after year, and because of that, our perceptions can become a little bit skewed. So unless you practice in a setting with regular exposure to typically developing children, you may not regularly remember that kids really do talk <laughs> and they talk by the t certainly by this 24 month level and so you may start to think about your assessment or your evaluation indicators as normal and we have to really remember that these skills when they're listed here are really the bottom end of normal when we see them on our assessment tools and so we have to really keep that in mind so how can we say that well let me give you again some evidence-based practice or some research to uh, really explain this example so let's look at some data about vocabulary size throughout childhood, but we're going to zero in on the range that we're talking about, which is 24 months. So again, take a look at your handout because you've got that chart right there. And so by 12 months, vocabulary size in typical development, and again, this is what we see when we look at just normative data, not necessarily what we see on our assessment tools. Vocabulary size in typical development by 12 months is two to six words other than mama or dada. And what we see on our assessment tools is one to two words other than mama or dada. And so you see, we've pulled it way back to that bottom end of normal. For 15 months, vocabulary size and typical development is about 10 words. Vocabulary size on assessment tools hangs right there, 8 to 10 words, and then 18 months is where we start to get this big disparity. By uh, uh, 18 months, vocabulary size and typical development is about 50 words. And then what do we see sometimes on assessment tools? We drop it way down to 15 words. And then by 24 months, the, range, the age range that we're discussing right now, in typical development, a vocabulary size is two to 300 words. So a typically developing 24-month-old on his second birthday is using between 200 and 300 words. Now, what do we have on our assessment tools? What's that indicator that we 
always use is 50 words by 24 months, right? So can you see that disparity there between the 50 word mark and then the, uh, the same age child, maybe in the same daycare classroom, the same preschool classroom, is using two to 300 words. Now, what does this mean for us? I mean, does this mean that we will uh, start to qualify any kid who <laughs> has has less than 50 words maybe not it's probably or a kid who just let's say, let's make it even harder let's say a kid who has 50 words and you're really comparing him to that uh, that typical language development vocabulary size of 200 300 words you know it really depends on the eligibility criteria for your own program if you're in private practice you might have a little bit of leeway there but look at that difference and that is my point here is that we always have to keep in mind what those standardized tests are really telling us. And usually we're looking at when most children, about 90% of children, when we take kids of all different age, uh, or not age, but all different levels of ability there, and we plot them on the graph, we're looking at kids, again, when, when we qualify for them for services, they're usually in those single digit uh, uh, range there. So below that 10% level, lots of times in the public school system, you're just only going to treat the kids who are falling in that bottom two or three percentile uh, uh, range. So again, a really, really important thing for you to talk about. Let's go back and even make it more interesting and look at what the CDC says. And so we're saying that by 24 months that a child a child with typical language development has 200 to 300 words and the CDC came in and said by 30 months they just need three words. So look again at that disparity there and we need to be sure that we are uh, including evidence-based information when we're sharing this with parents when we're talking about vocabulary development. All right let's go on and look at these norms through school age and again I would encourage you to consult your handout for uh, the written chart with here but between one and one and a half toddlers develop a 20 to 50 word vocabulary that we've talked about. By two, we're using kind of the same uh, numbers we've just talked about, the 200 to 300 word vocabulary. By the time a child with typical development turns three, he has 900 to 1,000 words in that expressive language vocabulary. By four, it's 1,500 to 1,600 words. By five, it's 2,100 to 2,200 words. And by six, the typical six-year-old has a 2,600 word expressive expressive language vocabulary. So again, why is vocabulary development important? It drives academic success. So the educational research has a strong correlation with uh, vocabulary size and how it uh, correlates with reading comprehension, intelligence, and then just general academic ability. And so we have to be sure that we are thinking about vocabulary size and moving it along, not just for our, <laughs> our kids, again, who are like talkers, but this is actually the goal for all children uh, throughout childhood. And if we think about the correlation with language skills and reading, when we see that in kindergarten, and first and second grade, children are learning to read, but by the time they hit third grade, children are reading to learn. And so again, why does this matter for us when we're talking about early intervention? We know, again, the connection between language and reading and language and, again, general academic success. And so that's why we have to light a fire <laughs> under those of us who are not taking this quite as seriously as we should, or certainly with parents or with the educators um, that we're working for, uh, working with. So let's just take an example of that child who's reading to learn at the third grade level. Let's just say he's learning about something like, again, the life cycle of a butterfly. And he's reading, he has to already know words like butterfly and caterpillar and egg and leaf. And then as he's reading, he increases that vocabulary level, that next little bump up and learns new words like a larva and pupa. And I wrote some of the words, other words down here that I'm not even able to kind of find on my notes right now. And again, that's how advanced this vocabulary uh, uh, drive is in early elementary school. So we have got to pay attention to this. And again, not, not only just for our little friends who are like talkers, but for all children. So one important way that speech language pathologists and other therapists can apply this information or this milestone of using new words regularly is also to help us determine if a child has a language delay versus a language disorder. Now why is this important? Kids with language delays who are beginning to add new words regularly 
meaning without lots of direct intervention on your part, what do we know about them? We know that their little systems are taking over, and again, that delay is resolving. Delay always means that the developmental sequence is there, it's just really, really slow. It's different with a disorder. With a disorder, it means that there's a typical development, and again, that development is not only slow, but it's also different. And so sometimes in this age of neurodiversity, we think, oh, well, it's gonna be okay, it all works out, every child is different. That is is true but on the other hand it's really not and we give parents that false sense of security when we tell them not to worry when their children are missing these broad the big pattern and so again it is an important distinction for you to make as a therapist in early intervention whether a child has a delay or whether there's a disorder that's not to be doom and gloom but it's certainly to help parents understand realistically what they're looking at with their child and we know again that if a child has a language disorder he's going to need services with greater duration and greater intensity uh, so so again parents know what to expect there. So one more thing about this milestone, when, we're, when a child is adding new words regularly, it's also a really good marker for discharge. So if a child's vocabulary is stagnant, no matter what his age, he is not going to be ready for discharge from speech therapy services. Even if you feel like he's moving along, well, his MOU is better, he's matched up with this, but you think he hasn't added new words in a really, really long time? We know that we've got to keep that going because of all the information uh, that we've talked about with vocabulary development driving academic success throughout not just the preschool period but uh, beyond that into elementary school. So if a child is not adding new words regularly, he still needs speech therapy no matter how old he is. Now let's quickly review how to help a child add new words. Now I've done lots of shows about this, so this is just going to be a super quick review, really of the titles or the names of the strategies, so that uh, as an SLP you can uh, really remember these and be able to recall these and talk with these about parents. The first one really is to be very intentional about teaching language. Now late talkers we know are not just going to pick it up the regular way with parents as they had, had been doing it and how do we know that? Because it hasn't already happened. So we have to really talk to parents about being intentional, be on the floor, be face to face to ensure that you're getting that engagement and interaction. Does a child know that you're talking to him? Is he connected with you? Is he engaged? Is he listening? And then we move on to the strategies that we know that are so helpful with receptive language development because why do, why do we say that? Because we know that receptive language drives expressive language and children have to understand what words mean before they can use words to communicate. So we have to help a child, again, get that language comprehension piece going. We've talked a lot about the cues that we use with tell him, show him, help him. But once a child understands that words, then we kick in, we start to use our language facilitation techniques. Now I'm going to be talking about 11 <laughs> language facilitation techniques that are super important. Again, we're going to run through these so quickly because these are the things that we've discussed a lot in the series, but I want to be super tight about this age range because it is language uh, explosion uh, territory where uh, that's supposed to be the primary thing happening. So I want to be sure that you know the tools that you have that you can share with parents. So your first strategy, and again, that you can look at this on your handout, is give a child words. Now, speech language pathologists call this what? We call this linguistic mapping, but sometimes that terminology is uh, too complex for parents and they start to kind of zone out. But really, give a child words means what? It means that you are going to say what a child would say if he could talk. And how do you know this? You use his cues. And so you, you work as sort of an interpreter. And so instead of doing a lot of the adult blah, 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 blah that we do, we just simply model what we want a child to say. So when he's reaching up to you, what would you say with using the strategy for linguistic mapping? You would say, up or up mama or something like that or hold me or pick me up and again you want to keep it at the language level that the child is currently functioning at or even just that one little step above so if he's using lots of single words or not using any words at all you should use single words if he's starting to use some phrases here you would use phrases so let that be your guideline so linguistic mapping so you model what a child can copy or repeat from you and and uh, that's just the number one strategy that we want to teach all parents. Now, why do we teach them that 
first because again it gets them uh, uh, focused in the right direction with what their child is trying to communicate and, and really gets them on the same page. The second strategy uh, builds in nicely with this and this is for the parents again that that aren't don't have the finesse with linguistic mapping that we would like for them to have. And for those parents, we really teach simplification or making things easier. And again, why is that? So that a child will have half a shot at being able to say what you want them to say. And so if a child can't imitate a phrase or a whole sentence, we have to do lots of simplification to break it down to be sure that a child can understand those words and then begin to imitate those words and then begin to use those words to communicate. And Again, it always goes in that little pattern. First they understand, then they imitate, and then they use those words to communicate. All right, that was strategy number two, simplify. So don't spend lots of time talking in paragraphs with a new talker at this developmental level. We wanna bring it way down. Lots of single words for children who aren't talking, uh, again, using single words frequently, and then those short phrases for children who are just at that phrase level or using phrases on their own. The third strategy here is mother ease or parent ease. So, so what does that mean? That means that you're going to use a sing-song voice. Now this irritates some adults and they just, and even some therapists, I'll hear some therapists who primarily don't work in early intervention talk about how the prosodic uh, uh, variations that we use with, with kids who are in this birth or foot three developmental period can sometimes uh, be a little bit irritating because it's not that adult cadence or that adult model, but frankly, research says that this is what helps kids learn how to talk. So instead of saying, do you want a cookie, we need to be saying what? Cookie! And again, modeling that that uh, melodic, sing-song uh, kind of prosody or cadence when we are trying to uh, teach a child to talk and get a child to imitate. All right, the fourth strategy that we want to use here is expectant waiting. And we know that we can talk about this with parents, but usually uh, uh, using another kind of terminology terminology like saying use your tell me face and that's again the body language that we use that would help a child uh, build that excitement level and, and that anticipation with knowing that it's his turn to talk. So usually we're leaned forward with this expectant waiting, we're pausing, we might you know get our bigger crazy eyes here, maybe even you know our, that little gasp and our mouth open and again that provides that opportunity or that cue that we're sending non-verbally to that child like it's your turn. And just that change alone can sometimes uh, really help a child get over that hump and start to imitate. So that's an important one. All right, the fifth language facilitation strategy that we want to use at this developmental level is repetition. And I am repetitious when I talk about repetition because it's so, so important. And again, it's evidence-based. Children need to hear words over and over and over again before they start to understand words. And the, the uh, statistic that I always use is that a child needs to hear words at least 30 times before he understands it and then 18 times beyond that which is the Caroline, Bow, uh, Caroline Bowen uh, uh, milestone that we use 18 times after that to begin to say that word. So let's just think about how repetitious that we have to be when we're talking uh, with late talkers. And again therapists this comes so naturally to us. We can just beat that dead horse <laughs> over and over and over with that uh, single word target that we're using but again, sometimes parents don't understand why we're being that repetitive. And children who are late talkers, particularly children who have also had comprehension difficulties, really, really require that level of repetition before they can begin to imitate and then use a word on their own. The sixth strategy that we want to be sure that we're sharing with parents is teaching them how to use withholding. So what is withholding? That means that we are just going to cue a word and the guideline that I use is three to five times before we give them the object that we want. So let me give you an example. Let's say that a child wants a donut. <laughs> He's pointing at it. You know that that's what he wants. He just can't come up with that word. So what do you say? Or what do you do? I hope you're not just giving it to him and saying here and then walking away. <laughs> not going to help him learn that word at all, right? So you've got to really get those three to five word models in there. So you can say something like, 
oh, you want a donut? And then you're going to pause to see if he'll imitate it at that point. Probably not if he's a late talker, right? And then you'll say, yes, I'll give you this donut. But I want you to say donut. Tell me donut. You say it, donut. So there you've gotten to that fifth model. However, there are some little friends of ours who are late talkers that cannot handle that level of cueing and they immediately become frustrated after that first model or two for donut. So what do you do? Go ahead and give it to them anyway, but you keep providing those models. You want him to hear that word donut because one, he has to hear that repetition. And again, uh, you want to create that opportunity for him to use that word communicatively, not just imitatively. And so when we do the withholding, when we give them an opportunity to say the word before before they get the object, uh, again, it increases that motivation level. Uh, but don't ever use that. Otherwise, you're just being plain mean, and we certainly don't want to see that uh, when we're working with our little friends. All right, the seventh most important language facilitation strategy for expressive language development is bit by bit. So what does that mean? It means you're going to give a kid one piece at a time. So let's go back to our donut example. We're not going to give the child the whole donut. Even if he says donut perfectly the first time, we still want to break it down into pieces. And we can do this with toys too. And again, it just gives them that additional opportunity to use their little words if they're not using the word spontaneously, certainly to imitate it as we're using withholding. So lots of these strategies uh, work together and work really, really well, again, to get those words going. The eighth strategy here is one that we talk about all the time, and it's giving choices, giving two choices for everything. We're going to talk about that more in a little bit, uh, so we'll just quickly skip over that now, but certainly that's a big strategy, a really important strategy, and it can make a big difference in the number of words that a child uses with you, particularly during a speech therapy session. So you've got to get really, really good at giving choices for everything. The ninth strategy here is verbal routines or carrier phrases. And again, this is something that I've kind of built my career on, but it means that we say the same things at the same time. And then eventually after we use that little verbal routine over and over and over, we start to pause to give a child an opportunity to fill in that last word. Now you can call this the completion method or the close <laughs> method or whatever you wanna say. But again, it's using that expectant waiting. So that strategy, I think it was the fourth one that we talked about, paired with this strategy with verbal routines to really create that opportunity for a child to talk. And so again, it includes things like that are automatic speech like ready, set, where we pause for a child to fill in go, or one, two, and for a child to fill in three, or we could even set up uh, carrier phrases with this, like when a child is trying to request, we can do the beginning part of it. I want a, and we wait for them to fill in whatever that word is. And again, some of our little guys need this extra ump for this extra cue to be able to get over that hump to process and then recall and use the word that we want them to use there. Our tenth strategy here is another one that I talk about all the time which is using sabotage or communicative temptations. So this means that we just set up situations that encourage a child to talk. So we might put things that they want up high on shelves rather than being immediately available. So again, it creates that opportunity so they have to initiate. Sometimes they have to use their little gestures and then use their words. And so again, it could be something as simple as, uh, and you've seen this if you've watched my DVDs or therapy clips and with children and other courses where I have all my toys and zip flock bags and so a child has to uh, in some way indicate open so that we can get that routine going and get that play going and so this is certainly something that we want to teach our parents how to do it might be if a child is ready to uh, do uh, uh, if he likes to color likes to use markers to draw we might give him the paper but then hold those markers back and sabotage that a little bit so that he has to ask you for the markers. If you're putting him in a bathtub and he won't, don't give him his toys right away. Hang back a little bit. Maybe give him an empty cup when he wants something with juice so he has an opportunity to ask you for that juice or ask you for that milk. And so again, you can get super, super creative with that. We, we've talked about that in a lot of shows, but I wanted to remind you of that. And the 
last one here, the 11th language facilitation strategy is novelty. So that's to do something new and unexpected so that a child again has a new opportunity to communicate. This is super important after the pandemic and lockdowns. So many children have not had exposure to just regular everyday experiences that babies in previous years automatically received and especially uh, during the pandemic and certainly in this last year I've gotten emails from parents and grandparents and caregivers who say things like you know I'm taking care of this baby who's only been out of her house you know five times for doctor's appointments and so that child has a whole different perspective of of uh, normal everyday life than a child who routinely has had an opportunity to uh, be with people and to go to different places and do other things so remember that we're going to have to introduce new and unexpected things certainly this is situational and we can also talk about it even within the context uh, not necessarily of a child who's who's really sort of had a version of environmental deprivation but even uh, down to the session level so as speech language pathologists we use different toys we put toys in new places to create a surprise that was one of the reasons that toy bags worked so well and we all use those for years and years because we were bringing in that novelty and bringing in those new experiences to to create interest in new talkers. And so we still have to do that. All right, that was a super quick summary of the most effective language facilitation strategies for this developmental range. And again, we talked about that why, because we wanna build that vocabulary and help a child learn to add those new words regularly. If you need that list, take a look at the handout. There are good examples for you there. And again, the link is below for the handout. The next milestone is uses single words frequently. All right, this is another huge milestone for parents. And we've already said this is when parents really feel like, yes, finally, my child is talking. So here by this developmental level, so by 24 months, we expect to hear single words all the time. And on some of our assessments, especially uh, I'm thinking about the infant toddler, or the Rossetti infant toddler language scale, we actually see this milestone by 21 months. So right here again, during this language explosion. Now for our late talking little friends, this will happen later, but we want it to happen. We want them to be using uh, single words frequently. So what can we do to facilitate that? We have to provide that expectation and those opportunities for children to talk. And we know that talking begins with what? It really does begin with solid imitation skills. So the more a child imitates, the more he or she will be able and ready to use those words on his or her own. Sometimes as therapists, you know, we kind of go the other way. We try to get a child to stop imitating why, because we are so afraid of echolalia. But unless a child is quoting long passages and unless he's really, really self-directed, even in his little single word attempts, you know, he's like kind of over in the corner sort of talking to himself, all the time without really directing that to other people. Unless he's doing that, don't worry about how often he's imitating. You wanna get him into imitating more and more and more and more because the more he imitates, the more he's going to be able to eventually be able to use those words on his own. So keep modeling and keep t uh, thinking about pushing that imitation piece. So let's talk about the best, for kids who aren't, for kids who aren't at this level. Now, let's kind of talk, back up a little bit and let's quickly review the strategies that we just talked about in the previous milestone to increase the frequency of words. And again, this would be for a child who knows how to talk, who has a decent sized vocabulary, but doesn't use his words very often. Again, the number one strategy is create that opportunity. So we do that with expectant waiting. Remember we, we talked about the uh, tell me face there where we're leaning forward and we're using all of our body language and we're, we're using the, the prosody with our own voices to build excitement and build anticipation. And we we talked about the I want a and leave that pause there for that child to fill in. And again, we can do it if a child isn't at that level. We back them and do it with social games so that we really get that strategy going. And then we move forward with sort of the carrier phrase option there. But expectant waiting is super, super important. Now, choices, again, uh, a great way to increase the frequency of the words that we hear in the session. So we keep those choices going 
all session long, and I share this all the time, you know, you really can get with, with skilled use of offering choices with a kid who's just, who might, if you if you just cued a tiny bit, say two or three words in, say, a whole farm activity versus, you know, 25 or 30 words if you keep those choices going. And so that's certainly something that we want to do. And this is easy with an activity like puzzles because, you know, your choices are built in. You're going to set the puzzle out. You're going to hold the pieces up and say, do you want the dog or the the cat. You want the cow or the pig. You want the horse or the goat. And you just keep those choices going. And that's easy for a lot of parents as they're playing with a structured uh, toy or an activity that the choices are kind of inherently built in. But you also have to train parents to do it with other activities too. And the best way to train them is for you to model it. So with, let's say, an activity like uh, you're asking a child, do you want to play with blocks? Do you want to play with these baby dolls? And then you give them the option, you know, if you have a bag or a basket or whatever, you know, are we going to leave it open or shut? You know, who's going to zip this bag? You know, Laura or Brandon? You know, you keep those choices going. What should we get out next? Do you want the bottle or the baby? you want the bowl or the spoon? Do you want the, the fork or the diaper? Again, you just keep those choices going. And why are we doing that? We're keeping them talking. And again, this is the way to increase that frequency. And sometimes when we give those choices like that in that really fast-paced way that also helps kids bump up and start to use their spontaneous words a little more often too. We're also using the strategy of bit by bit or one piece at a time here to increase that frequency. So in therapy you should never give a child a whole bowl of goldfish <laughs> even if you were at his or her house providing therapy there. You're going to give them one at a time and have them ask for more. If you're playing with a race car set you'll never give you know all the pieces to the race cars or racetrack. You're going to withhold those and and give those choices so that they have those opportunities to communicate and again increase that frequency of those single words. If you have a ball toy with three balls you let them ask for the balls one at a time. It's hard for parents to do this all the time at home just in the context of their daily routines but they can certainly do it in play and this is a fantastic strategy for increasing that frequency and helping children learn how to talk all the time. So talking all the time is a really big part of this language explosion phase and so we have to be sure that that's happening in every setting with the child not just therapy so we make sure that parents have these strategies and they know when to use them and how to apply them at home and again this isn't just something that they're doing during their therapy time with the child but all the time super super important to make uh, make this happen where kids realistically are using uh, single words frequently and they are adding those new words regularly so go back and look at that hand out when you need uh, some additional ideas to get that going. Now we're ready to move on and talk about the next exciting milestone that occurs during this developmental period and this is that a child begins to use phrases. So there are two big milestones here that we talked about. One is that they imitate short phrases and again that always comes first. We talked about this a lot back in uh, the previous expressive language show in 453 and then here we want to talk about using these short phrases spontaneously and again this would be short two and three word phrases. So let's start with this first one where we're really looking at increasing that uh, mean length of utterance and this is imitate short phrases and again we, we've said over and over and over but I want to be sure that you know this so that you are sharing this with parents. We're not going to hear a kid begin to use short phrases until he what? imitate short phrases first and so this is certainly true of our little friends with language delays Now they may pop out a holistic phrase a phrase learned as one whole word like thank you or all done or come on those kinds of words we can't count those as phrases per se until you hear a child use uh, one of those words in, uh, and combine it with another word to make a spontaneous or original phrase. So with thank you, all done, again, count those as single words. And again, as a therapist, as an SLP, you should certainly know that, but our colleagues who are developmental interventionists or EI specialists or certainly parents won't really do that and they might be giving a kid credit for phrases when he's not really there yet. So be sure that you're talking about those differences. Um, it is fine to think about using holistic phrases as a way 
to get a child to phrases and actually that's one of the four strategies that I'm about to share with you now that really enhance uh, phrase imitation. Let me say again, uh, we have to also be sure that a child can use two syllables together before this is a realistic goal. And some of our little friends with motor planning issues are apraxia. That's the hump that we have to get them over first. These strategies will still work to do that, but I wanted to put that little uh, caveat in there for those of you who are SLPs and really thinking about that. So let's talk about the four strategies that really enhance phrase imitation. Number one, use your sing-song voice or your prosody, the parent ease. So instead of saying more please, you're going to say what? More please. Uh, and again, this can drive some adults crazy. They don't understand why you're doing it. So you have to share that a child won't talk like this forever. This is just to help his little brain tune in and hang on to the words you're using and then be more motivational for him to want to imitate you there. The second strategy here is choosing a few high frequency frequency combinations to practice, practice, practice. So you kind of set up a little uh, target, a little set of targets for children uh, who again are at that two word level. So something like bye bye dada or uh, more milk or something they would say all the time. And again, you choose these uh, little high frequency phrase combinations to really practice. And those are the phrases that you stick to uh, for a while to really make sure that a child again begins to acquire the ability to sequence those words together, can hold on to what those words are, and then again be able to use use those words spontaneously. The next one that we talked about, uh, we've talked about already, holistic phrases. So these are, remember we said what children learn is one whole word. So we talked about thank you and all done, but other words or other little phrases like no way, or I got it, or I did it, or where'd it go, or where are you? Those kinds of things that we all say is one long word. Those can help lots and lots of children bump on up to that phrase level. The fourth strategy here is called expansion. And as an SLP, you totally know what that means, and we do this instinctively. But again, we have to be really purposeful about teaching parents to do this and also teaching our colleagues to use expansion, our colleagues who are developmental interventionists or OTs or PTs. And so this strategy, again, is super, super important. So what is expansion? It's imitating any single word that a child uses adding one relative or relevant word with that that makes sense in context, repeating that to the child and then encouraging the child to imitate the phrase. So, and if you you get a bonus, there is an increased chance that a child will do it if you pick words that he's already using in his single word vocabulary. So picking familiar words. So if he says car to ask for a car, what could you say? You could say something like car please, or want car, or I want car. You know, adding those one or two extra words there, expanding his phrase. When he sees a car and is just labeling it, car, what would you say? There's car, or look a car. Or again, a look a car wouldn't be the best example. But again, you're putting, you're expanding, you're putting um, another word with that to make a two word phrase. If he's making the car move, you could say what? Go car. And when you're playing with cars and you just want to tease him and get him engaged with you, you might teasingly take his car and say, my car. And again, you set up that situation for him to take the word that he said, you expand it with another word, and then for him to be able to imitate that phrase. So. Uh, be sure that you're sharing these strategies with parents. You have to model them and really be intentional then about saying to a parent, did you see what we did there? Did you see what made the difference for your child? And you're really giving words and helping a parent, again, call a strategy what you call it so that they're understanding which strategies uh, are most effective in this situation and then what it is that you are doing that, that works so that they can also use that same strategy at home. If you want more information about teaching a child to imitate phrases, please take a look at podcast number 429, and I'll go ahead and link that below so that you can get this information in its longer form. Now the next milestone is begins to use short phrases spontaneously. So we just talked about imitating phrases and again that should be fully, fully, fully established by 24 months in typical language development. 
But after, shortly after a child begins to imitate phrases, we should start to hear some of those phrases on his own. So in typical language development, remember we said this actually happens back in the previous period by 18 months, but our assessments say 24 months here that we want to hear uh, those two word phrases spontaneously. So we're not going to hear phrases uh, emerge spontaneously until a child has a large enough core vocabulary. And so usually we think about that 35 to 50 word mark until a child, and that's, that's why all of these milestones really do come in logically and sequentially in typical development. And even when there's a delay, it's still slow, but it's still kind of coming in in this way. Until we hear kids, as we already said earlier, use new words regularly and use single words frequently, they're not going to be able to use phrases and certainly not going to be able to use them on their own. Not something that they've learned as one whole word or something that they've heard you say. And so we have to make sure that we are constantly thinking about vocabulary development, again, not as just a way to expand single words, but as a way to give a child a large enough vocabulary bank, for lack of a better word, to be able to pull these words and again, on his or her own, come up with those new little word combinations for phrases. Otherwise, um, if, if we work on phrases too soon and we have a late talker that we've taught just a lot of uh, holistic phrases and just phrases here and there, you know, uh, I want more, or give me that, or whatever you've taught them as a way to functionally use language. And again, our ABA, our friends in ABA, our colleagues don't always understand that. Then phrases become a splinter skill, just like any other splinter skill. And what are they going to do? They're going to hold on to those little splinter skills and use them, but not really fill in that foundation to get there. And so again, their communication seems pretty disjointed because you think, well, he's talking, he's got all these little phrases, but they're really not functional. Why? Because he doesn't have a large enough sense single word vocabulary to be able to make his own little phrases. And so you've got to really think about that. And certainly that's more, uh, it's more of a need in our little friends who have autism or who will go on to be diagnosed with autism. So for every kid on our caseload, we have got to focus on vocabulary development. And remember when we said that? Because every typical kid is also focusing on vocabulary development. Remember what we said that they learn about eight words a day from eight 18 months to six years old. And so everybody's learning. You know, the snowball is just getting bigger and bigger and bigger when we think about language acquisition here. And so we've got to focus on vocabulary development. Now, sometimes when we tell parents this, they focus just on one word class. And so it's, it's usually it's nouns or names of things. And that's great because the vocabulary of most late talkers consists of nouns, but you've got to have words from other classes. And so in every, for every show in this podcast series from show 450 on, uh, I, especially the expressive shows, I've included a vocabulary list. So I've done it from, uh, for this show as well, so that you've got a good idea of different kinds of words. So you need names for a child's favorite things, so the nouns, other early generic words for requesting and social functions like more and please and hi and bye bye, thank you, all those kinds of things. But even words that are like early directives like go and open and up. And again, go and open or what, those are verbs. And up is what, it's a preposition, but at the same time, these are really directive kinds of words that lots of toddlers use and certainly will use as they start to generate their own phrases. Certainly other kinds of uh, verbs, other descriptive words and pronouns, and uh, I think we already said prepositions and location words. So we're certainly going to need all of these different kinds of words to be present and not just one or two types of, you know, all these examples. We need lots of verbs. You know, you, you need 20 different verbs and 50 different nouns and, and, you know, five different prepositions. And that's really the kind of vocabulary mix that we're looking at uh, for toddlers who are in this space. And so, again, vocabulary development is a super uh, prerequisite that's going to be absolutely necessary before a child begins to generate his own phrases. So when we have a child that's a late talker and we're not hearing phrases come in on their own just because we've increased their single word vocabulary, and that's how it happens in typical development. You teach enough single words and then they start to use phrases on their own. For lots of our little friends who are late talkers, we have to teach predictable phrase patterns. And so I've given you a lot of information about that on the second page of your handout. So take a look at that now and let's talk about what we call 
anchor phrases. So motor planning is going to be a lot easier for a child if you're using a phrase pattern like we talked about. We can almost think about it like a carrier phrase, but here you're just changing one word of that. And so it's such a good strategy when a child can imitate phrases, but it's just having a hard time getting those going on his or her own. So you think about, I'm going to teach them these phrase shells or these anchor phrases. And so we're going to use, you know, if you've used the strategies, you've done sing song prosody to make it easier to imitate, you've given him the high frequency familiar patterns, you've done the holistic phrases, you've used expansion, here and you've, you're still not getting anywhere, you've got to double down and practice these anchor phrases. So the ones that I start with first are, and again this is on your handout, more plus a noun that he uses all the time. And again, some therapists get so bit out of shape <laughs> about teaching the word more. And they don't want to teach the word more because they think a child overgeneralizes it and uses it for everything. And that's just usually the adult's fault. Instead of the child, we haven't taught enough additional words for a child to be able to, to fill in. And he just grabs what he knows and uses it. And, and my point here is more is still such a functional word because it's often how we help a child bump up to phrases. So certainly a good Good, uh, reason to keep teaching that word as a single word. So more plus a noun, a noun plus please. And again, if a parent is super concerned about manners and those kinds of things, they're already working on that. So use that as your advantage there. More please is another kind of a generic, uh, if you're just thinking, gosh, if I could just get that length, if I have a kid that, you know, again, is a praxic or I know that they're a motor planning issues there that maybe won't rise to the level of a full diagnosis of apraxia, but I know that there's just this little motor planning hump, and I'm really just working on those, those two definitive syllables there that I want to combine and get something super functional. A phrase like more please will work there. Bye-bye plus a name, hi plus a name. You can even use nouns there. Night-night, you know, as you're playing, uh, with the child, and again, what you do with these anchor phrases is you take one or two of those patterns and you practice those exclusively through the whole session. And again, our little friends with the praxis, I really, really need this step. A great one to start with that I didn't mention is saying my with an object that he's using. Now, again, you don't want to overly frustrate a child or cause a two-year-old to immediately start to have those power struggles with you all the time, but that certainly is a great little word to get this kind of fast-paced practice going. So there are even more phrase patterns for you to take a look at on your handout. And I have done a lot of uh, shows and a lot of podcasts about troubleshooting phrases and the phrase patterns. And I'm going to uh, give you the show numbers as we get to the end of this milestone. So you can go back and listen to those. But let's just take a minute now to talk about briefly what we do when we're troubleshooting phrases. What are some really specific strategies that we haven't talked about in this show? when a child is having difficulty combining words into phrases. The first one is backward chaining. So this is where we target the last word first, and then we add the first word. Now backward chaining works because our brains naturally hold on to the last bit of information that we've heard. And so when we practice that last part over and over, again, in that fast paced, rapid fire way to really activate those little brains, then we go back and add that first word. So let me uh, give you an example of this. Let's say that a child is asking for more juice. So when you're doing this, you would say juice, and the child imitates juice, and you would say, say juice, and the child says juice, and you would say, tell me juice, and the child says juice, and you might say it one more time, juice, and he says juice, and then you sneak in more juice, and then he repeats more juice. And again, the emphasis to get that going fast, and it's hard to do, it's hard for me to, hard to do without a child here doing it so that it makes sense, but you would say something like juice, juice, say juice, more juice. And again, that's how quickly, and you want those imitations coming really fast. So you can see, if you have a child who doesn't imitate that quickly, the strategy is not going to be as effective. Again, another reason to really, really, really double down and work on imitation so that a child is imitating that easily and that quickly. Your sing-song prosody will also help here. And one last word about uh, motor planning and our little friends who might go on to get a, a diagnosis of apraxia. You've got to think about this number of syllables as 
you're practicing. Don't overload a child's little uh, verbal planning system just to kind of, that, that's why the phrases sometimes don't work. So you might even have to simplify and pick uh, pick single word or single syllable words at the beginning. You know, if you're trying to get them to say something like, uh, bye bye grandmother, <laughs> they're not going to be able to say that, you know, bye dada would work better there or either, you know, bye ma or for mama, even if they're not sequencing those syllables yet. So be sure that you're looking at that. When a child can't do phrases yet it's usually related to these issues number one not there yet developmentally still below that 18 or even bumping up to this 18 to 24 month level they're just not there language wise you've got to get them there by working on all the other skills that we've talked about not enough vocabulary so you've got to build that single word vocabulary to where they're really spontaneously using 35 to 50 words at least on their own and again can't sequence syllables so that would tell us that motor planning or apraxia might be the reason that you're not hearing phrases if you need more help with phrases i told you about show 429 but i also want to mention podcast number 400 i'll link those below we went over this super super fast you can get a longer more detailed explanation with those shows but i wanted you to have it again here in this show because this is the primary thing that's going on here at the 18 to 24 month developmental level with expressive language. This is what makes a child have his or her language explosion. So those are the things that I want you to focus on too. Now let's quickly look at the last three milestones on our list. Now these are listed on several assessments from the 24 month level to the 36 month level. And so we're gonna talk about them a little bit today, but you'll hear bits and pieces of these next three skills uh, in our next expressive show to number 457. So this one is relates personal experiences. So back in the intro, when we were talking about these milestones, remember what we said, this is so exciting because a child begins to use words to Tell you what's happened uh, even when you're not present so he tries to communicate with words with things that are happening and lots of times these start to be kind of after the fact recounts that he's telling you so he's more conversational and he might even be initiating more than he did previously and even though this is happening I still want to caution you to not make this milestone more than it is this does not mean that a child's going to be able to answer every question that you ask him about what's happened in his day <laughs> That is unrealistic. Even up until, you know, kindergarten, early elementary school, you know, parents talk about this all the time with their children. I can't get, he's just not telling me what happened at school today. He won't ever, he gets in the car and I can't get a detail out of him. That's normal. That's completely typical. And what we're talking about here at this 24 month level means that they tell you about something like, you know, why are you crying? They might be able to say, fall down or push me. You know, if he's been in an altercation with his sibling and he's wailing and his brother is standing right there and your 24 month old might be able to pop out, push me, you know, and pointing to his brother. So they begin to use words to really relate these personal experiences. Now we'll talk about this more in show 457, but again, this is what's happening during this language explosion when a child is coming up with things on his own, when he's even able to tell you about stuff that you don't have that prior knowledge, that's when you know that he's really, really talking and that's certainly something that we see here. The next milestone refers to self by name. So this is precious when a child starts to do this. On many milestones list, stating your name, and this is different than stating your name. Stating your name can be on a test, uh, on an assessment by 24 months, on lots of the language assessments that we as speech language pathologists use, like the Rosetti is not on there till 36 months. But certainly using, a child using her own name or his own name in phrases starts to come in in this developmental period. They're speaking in third person. Why? Because they don't have pronouns yet, usually, which is the next skill that we're going to talk about. But it's really, really cute when this comes in. And again, they might say something like, you know, Eli want cupcake or go Noah's house or, or Noah house. He probably won't have that possessive S yet. But uh, lots of times as SLPs, we skip this phase because why? We want to move on to the next one, which is using early pronouns, and that's great. But so many of our little friends need this developmental step, and sometimes if a child isn't doing this, you might tend to skip it, which is something that I've done. But sometimes, again, that doesn't make pronouns meaningful for a child. He's not understanding that 
I means him and you means, you know, mama or dada. So using names here for a while longer, I've found does really help. But the next goal, which is using early pronouns occasionally, really, really make more sense. So let's go ahead and talk about pronouns here. So the earliest pronoun list that I have here on the third page of your handout there are just a few here in versions of the the me my mine so that's got i think about that sometimes kids will kind of hang on to one of those and then you know me do it me turn me shoe give me all those kinds of things and then they kind of branch out and or, or kid might use my in those places uh, certainly there are lots of kids that we call them mind kids because that's all they tend to say mine 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 but it's such a powerful word uh, and again that's certainly something that we see come in here sometimes parents don't like this because they think that we're encouraging their children to be selfish but they would use the, those words on their own so again certainly something that we want to think about me my and mine and uh, I've already given you that example of being able to combine uh, my with phrases and how what a great target that is for getting a kid to be able to use uh, two words uh, together in a phrase and the other pronouns that come in at this level are are I and you and they usually don't come in until after we've heard some of uh, some version of me my or mine uh, holistic phrases are where we predominantly hear early pronouns occur first I love you I did it um, where are you? That's where we start to hear I and you come in first. But pronouns are going to be a major focus in the next developmental period from 24 to 30 months. So we're going to talk about that a lot more in show 457. All right, so that's our list of expressive language milestones, 18 to 24 months. I gave you lots of examples in the show today for teaching those skills and everyday routines, but I also want to share another resource for you. It's a toy list that I've developed with lots of great options for teaching language. And again, I've ranked these toys and categorized them uh, per developmental range. And so I'll include that link here on YouTube uh, in the post below. And I hope you'll take advantage of those recommendations as well. And on those toy lists, I've given you some good examples of therapy activities that you could use uh, with those toys. And again, paired them with the developmental age ranges. So take a look at that. I know that's going to help you. Now, the best resource for teaching all the skills that we've talked about in this Language Milestones podcast series is my therapy manual called Teach Me to Talk the Therapy Manual, and I'll put this link below, but it is a fantastic guide for you as a parent of a late talker if you are working with your child at home and you need to know specific recommendations. Maybe your speech language pathologist is not, it's just kind of a focusing on real general things uh, with language development, and you need those really specific goals so you know what to work on at home. This is a fabulous resource for you. If you are a professional, this is a resource that I know you'll refer to time time again as you uh, write your short-term goals and come up with activities not only to do in your sessions but to share with parents so these are my best ideas for teaching all the milestones from right at 12 months all the way up to 48 months for both receptive and expressive language so I hope that you will check that out now don't forget to get your CE credit for today's show if you are listening to the podcast be sure that you go to Teach Me to Talk in the next few days and go ahead and sign up for the CE credit. You've already done the hard part, which is listen to the show and go ahead and get your credit there. Uh, if it's your first show with us, again, I want to thank you for being here. We are so grateful to have you and we hope that you'll take advantage of the 77 plus courses that we have in our library. Quit paying for those subscriptions where you get I have to take all kinds of <laughs> courses that don't relate to your everyday practice. We can help you with our courses that are specifically designed for early intervention. All right, so that's all for today. I'm Laura Mize, pediatric speech language pathologist, and thank you so much for joining me for Teach Me to Talks podcast.